Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I've been excited all week, month. We have Craig Clemens who's one of the top copywriters and direct response marketers. Now a little bit about Craig. He got his start writing copy for Double Your Dating which grew to over $20 million per year. Since then he's co-founded three new eight-figure businesses in the last five years in the diverse industries of nutrition, cosmetics, and dating advice. His most recent successful sales promotion brought in over one million dollars in sales in the first two days and it's off of cold banner traffic, no launch, no affiliates, and I can't ask about it because it's still running, so don't uh, don't get upset if I uh, don't ask questions about it. I may ask anyways. Um, he's also a co-star in a reality show, Lucky Bastards, which follows his life along with five other entrepreneurs in New York City. Craig, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. So I said I can't ask about it, but I'm going to. Um, so it's still running. What can you tell me about the thought process behind the cold banner traffic in that launch that doesn't give anything away that would jeopardize it. Absolutely. So the product is something that can benefit every single person uh, on the planet, I feel. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the same time, when you're thinking about how to get inside the head of someone, uh, no one is going to want to voluntarily listen to a sales message. So it goes mm -hmm. back to creating something that is valuable information. Mm -hmm. So what I inspired to do there was create a sequence which you know starts with the banner and then goes into the uh, promotion which was the video sales letter that would be absolutely captivating for anyone to learn about no matter where they were in the world mm -hmm. um, and woman, teenager, elderly, all that. So. I researched into the product and I found a story attached to it that was just uh, bizarre, twisted, and one of those type of things, uh, you know, when you see like on the uh, uh, um, Facebook newsfeed, all these like upworthy articles and things like that, and it's like, you know, when this boy's birthday party started, it seemed normal, but what he said next made my heart stop beating and fall out of my chest and melt, you know, like something like that. Um, I found a story that was captivating enough uh, to, you know, have some type of tricky banner like that. And then I just told that story. And the upside of, of the story is it uh, explained exactly why they needed uh, product X and mm -hmm. they uh, went along and took my advice. So was that the first version of it? I mean, I'm wondering kind of what the different iterations because sometimes you don't always start with the successful out of the gate. Absolutely not. No, this one I, re re <laughs> I began writing as what I would call a uh, standard sales letter. You know, hey, I started off with the basic headline benefit driven, you know, hey, if you're looking to X, Y, and Z, then, you know, without A, B, and C, then you need to pay attention. And then I just would start with that and mm -hmm. write like basic bare bones. Yeah. Let's try to write a buy the book sales letter in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love hearing your mindset with this. Yeah. And that's what I encourage my, my team to do as well because – if you write something by the book following the standard rules of the captivating, benefit-driven intro, a good story in there, and then some uh, strong reason why copy along with proof that your product or service meets their needs, um, and then of course encounter the objections and make a compelling offer, and you do it correctly, it's going to convert pretty well to at least your in-house list. And also to people who are typing in, I want X, you know, that We're looking exactly for that. So it'll give you something to start with that's usable. Um, now, something like that, though, is not necessarily going to convert on banner traffic, which, you know, is, is uh, cold traffic, which is where the big that's the ultimate stuff is made because, you know, you're talking about something specific. So if you're going to do something that you want to uh, convert on cold traffic, Depending on how urgent the problem is, sometimes you can just mention it, like uh, 
you know, what uh, uh, weight loss, you can just say, hey, you know, here's the, what's that new cliche banner or whatever, the one trick you must obey to lose weight. I mean, weight loss is big enough that you can just, just state it. Um, seen a lot of people do things like that with uh, the, the muscle building, like the uh, force factor, which has been huge the last few years. Um, teeth whitening is another one that can benefit anyone. Mm -hmm. But if you've got something like that that isn't as mass appeal, you got to find a way to make it mass appeal. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what I like to do is like, I'll write something basic that I know is going to work if type, people type in, you know, uh, whatever that is. And then uh, I'll take a step back and I'll be like, okay, how can I get into the head of someone who is just browsing around the internet, not even thinking about uh, losing weight or whatever, and get them to click on this and, uh, you know, get taken into a captivating journey mm -hmm. that eventually leads them to uh, a solution that makes sense for them is something they want. So in your process, when you said you do the, the regular long form sales letter, do you always convert, like you said, for this instance, you did a video sales letter. Was that just, uh, do you always kind of follow that process or was just this you found would work better in the video sales letter as opposed to the, the copy? Are you saying a video sales letter as opposed to like a web Like a page? long form, yeah, yeah. Like in this instance, you said it, that you... The, uh, doing pretty well um, in certain markets, but we've had other markets um, that we've found totally different pages worked even better. Mm -hmm. I actually think the uh, uh, muscle building niche is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. So the people you see running hardest in that niche are the ones that with like, uh, I think Force Factor runs harder than anyone in that, and they have been since 2008, 2009. And they don't use any video sales letters. They use uh, kind of like a, a, a more of like a, a CPA style sequence where they uh, have an article which talks about uh, some ground, groundbreaking supplement and it looks uh, like an actual news article. And then in it, it'll be like, you know, click here to learn more or get a free trial. And then the free trial page will pop up with like exciting graphics and uh, graphs and diagrams of muscles growing and uh, they'll have like some celebrities on there and things like that. And then simple order page, put in your name and information, you know, claim your free thing. And then, uh, you know, it's like a three step process and that seems to be crushing it for those guys. I'd have to imagine that's, uh, that market has tested video sales letters before. Mm -hmm. I've seen a couple of them, but I haven't seen anything run as hard as that. Mm -hmm. uh, CPA style. Yeah. And Craig, we'll talk about some specifics that you can talk about later, but I always like to get uh, a fun fact. I want to hear about your background. I get a fun fact. And you said a weird fun fact most people don't know about you is you had a large collection of snakes and lizards. That's a fact. Yes. So what did you do early on in your entrepreneurial career involving that? Uh, so yeah, we, my, my two brothers and I used to have the biggest reptile collection outside of a museum and most of them were wild that we would just find in the hills you know? really <laughs> like, oh yeah it was like kind of like a catch and release you know we'd keep them around for a few months <laughs> now uh, we'd run out of cages so we'd have to decide which ones to let go <laughs> uh put in the new cages so we had king snakes garter snakes uh blue belly lizards alligator lizards um we didn't get too into venomous uh <laughs> oh, <laughs> god but yeah, uh, what would your parents say about this stuff? It's pretty funny because my mom actually did. So there was uh, at no time was there not a snake loose in our house. That's crazy. There always a snake loose in the house. Always. <laughs> like, you know, it was absolutely 100% guaranteed that you'd come over to visit us, you know, in the uh, – mid 80s to 90s there would be at least one snake loose in the house but you know probably a lizard and maybe a frog or something too and my mom actually got pretty good at catching the snakes and lizards that would like get loose you know so come home from school one day my mom would be like oh yeah i found the snake craig he was you know it's caught out from under the oven and i caught him you know wow so she was awesome yeah she let you guys just get i mean what she was fine with it well, yeah, and then some, uh, another funny thing that would happen is, you know, the snakes would eat mice and rats, and sometimes you'd buy one that's a little too big for the snake, and the snake can't eat it, 
and then you have a dilemma of what to do with the rat, you know. So my mom would keep the rats, and then that would be her pet. <laughs> having pet rats too. That's crazy. So where did you grow up? Uh, Thousand Oaks, California. Nice. Okay. So you're in New York now. What made you decide to get out of the the nice warm weather and go to the cold New York? It was uh, totally on a whim. I was living in Hollywood, California. I was having a blast. And I've been in New York three or four times for conferences and that type of thing. And I hated it as far as uh, the actual city. I'd either come in winter when it was freezing, summer when it was burning hot. Uh, I'd usually stay in Midtown, which is not where someone uh, in my social circle wants to be. And if we went out, we'd end up at some shit tourist spot with uh, $20 Jack and Cokes and uh, no good-looking women as far as I could see. So I was like, oh, I don't know why people actually live there. What's the big deal about New York? I mean, it's a great city to go visit and get a slice of pizza. But that was all, all I got. So then I'm living in L.A. and I was having trouble finding a new place to live. My lease was up on my apartment. I looked all over the freaking city. I couldn't find anything except for another one bedroom in the building I lived in. And I wanted to get out of that side of town. And it was just looking like a terrible situation. Uh, for the first time, I had met someone who lived in New York that was my age that went out all the time. And he's like, no, come to New York with me. I'll show you around. And my friend Adam and I made a plan to do just that. However, come that day, it was like, uh, I remember it was like February, uh, early February, maybe February 8th. I had to be out of my place on February 28th, and I couldn't find a place to live. And I almost canceled the trip to New York to stay and look at apartments. But then I was like, oh, I've actually looked at every fucking apartment in the whole city of Hollywood. So what the hell? I'm just going to go to New York. So I went out to New York. And it was Fashion Week. And for the folks at home who have not been to Fashion Week in New York, if you're looking for a time to come to New York and do some partying, Fashion Week is just insane. I mean, every celebrity flies in from all over, along with uh, every model, male and female. And they all congregate in the restaurants and clubs and you know private parties and this and that. And a new friend of mine knew all of them. So really? Adam Came out. He took us to all these spots, you know, we're meeting all these amazing people. And on Sunday, I was like, fuck it, I'm moving to New York. So I went home and, uh, you know, gave notice. And uh, here I am, almost four years later. So, Craig, what, um, tell me about the early days of your career. What were you doing early on before copywriting? Before copywriting, I was a waiter, actually. Um, well, actually, even back further, I was um, uh, I began my my adult career in the exciting world of pizza delivery, and this was a lot of fun. Uh, I used to have a, a four cylinder Mustang convertible. It was um, bought at a used car lot. It was blue with uh, spray painted white wheels. Nice, you know, matching leather white interior. Um, the it was a stick shift and i remember taking great pride in um the fact that i could drive the stick shift eat a piece of pizza and smoke a cigarette at the same time while i was cruising around town um, looking back on that i'm very shameful of the fact that i used to be a smoker but driving the stick shift and eating pizza was fucking well, I don't know why I pictured dazed and confused when you give me that that picture. <laughs> I was, I was, I was dazed and confused. I was probably eighteen years old during this time. Um, so then, what what got you into copywriting? When did you get started in that? Well, I actually started in uh, writing copy without knowing it. My first job, oh, after pizza delivery, I started uh, waiting tables, which I was terrible at. I got fired from every waiting job I ever had. And then I was going to junior college. I was failing classes. Um, I'm not really good at anything else. If you <laughs> haven't picked that up, except for uh, eating pizza, pizza and writing copy, I'm, I'm pretty good at. You can make a living off that, yeah. Yeah, I don't even think I can catch a snake or a lizard anymore. Um, I heard about this job where people were selling uh, selling tools over the phone, and 
I had a couple of friends doing this, and they were making more money than people who were waiting tables. You know, not by much, but they were making, you know, 2000 2500 bucks a month. And they said it was a fun place to work. And I was like, oh, I like talking to people. You know, I could give this a shot. And I didn't really know what it is. And I get in there, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, telemarketing. And I'm like, oh, telemarketing, what the hell? Like, they just had that stigma around right, it. Right, that's a bit, yeah. But... I go in the first day and I'm listening to these people do this and it's like a row of cubicles on each side and each cubicle had a speaker box above it so you could hear both sides of the phone call. And what that was designed for is the sales managers would walk up and down the row and when they'd hear a, a salesman with a guy on the line that was like, you know, ready to buy but on the edge, they'd come over and they'd point at the salesman and when the salesman uh, would get a sales manager pointing at him, you had to look at him. And the sales manager would do what's called pitching you lines. So he would just give you exact lines of things to say. Interesting. So um, for uh, let me try to give you a work. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I'd be on the line with uh, you know uh, a farmer out in Missouri, whatever, and I'd be like, uh, you know, Mister Branford, I've got these. Uh, Set a set of wrenches out here. They're just fantastic. It's it's the biggest set of wrenches you ever seen. If you take them up and you put one on uh, each uh, each wall of your shop, they go around it sixteen times. The biggest wrench out here is so big. I got one guy out there who uses it as a baseball bat. And another guy who uses it as an anchor when he goes fishing. But uh, Mr. Branford, I got to warn you before I send you out a box of these wrenches to try. There's one thing I need to let you know about. They'd be, and then you just hold, right? Because you got you got to be the guy to, to to let them speak first. They'd be like, "What is it?" <laughs> well, Mr. Bradford, when you get these wrenches out there, make sure you have your sunglasses on, because the chrome on these things will blind you. We're like, ah, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and send you this box of wrenches. Uh, you know, give me your address out there. I'll send them out to you to try. If, if you like them, great. You just send me a check for four hundred dollars. If not, oh, four hundred dollars. Ah. And then the sales manager would come, would hear something like this, you know, and he'd come over and then he'd give you the point. And then you got to like do what he says. So he would point at the, in this situation, he'd probably be like, Mr. Bradford, you go, Mr. Bradford, I tell you what, I tell you what. And then he'd grab the thing and like, look at the address up there. And he'd be like, okay, I see you're out there in uh, Smithtown, Missouri. I've actually got a container truck going down to Smithtown, Missouri next week. And because of that, I could put this set of wrenches on there for you at the same container truck. And that would save me a lot of shipping money. You know how big these things are. It normally costs almost $200 to ship them. So I could meet you there and I could, I could knock $150 off the price to get them out there to you. I can get them out there for just $249. Bucks. But if I do that... I'm going to have to ask you to do me a favor. And you just wait and, you know, because you got to wait. And they got to ask you a favor. They're like, what's the favor? <laughs> Mr. Bradford, when you get these wrenches out there and you see they're every bit as good as I told you they were and more, next time you need something for the shop, pick up the phone, give me a call. Don't make me work so hard over here. They're like, okay, okay, I'll take them. Then you send them out. And, and then uh, it's like, okay, now here's the next item I got for sale, uh, you know. So that was a crazy interesting experience. Um, it got to the point where uh, I would, I was uh, um, write, writing the, so when we get a new product, someone would have to write the initial script where you tell them about how, you know, the wrenches are, can be used as a baseball bat and like just build up the this, yeah. uh, illusion of uh, how awesome they are in, in their mind. Um, so I was I would start writing those, and pretty soon the whole company was using the scripts that I would write. So I was actually that was like my first bit oh, of writing, and I was learning to paint pictures in someone's head and get them imagining, like you know, using the wrenches. And uh, you know, the most successful thing I wrote was a, a copy for this booster pack, and I had all these examples, you know, like hey, you know, when you're out there in the middle of winter and your car doesn't start, well, this thing is instead of having to call a friend, this thing just stays right in the back. You pull it up, and boom, you're right back on the road, you know. Imagine how how think uh, how much time that would save you waiting for a friend and and you know Mr. Johnson. I mean, 
what kind of man would I be not to keep one uh, in the back of my wife's car and also the back of my daughter's car? So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to send you a four pack. You've got four people you could use out there for these things, right? And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm going to send you this four pack. And, you know, when you get them out That's there, so true. it should be a favor. <laughs> it's a favor. <laughs> well, when you see these things work out, out good, you know, and your neighbor asks you where you got them, give your neighbor my name and number. But keep that price under your hat. Special price just for me and you. Fair enough? Fair enough. Okay, I'll send them out. So we're doing that stuff. And then uh, I got to be one of the uh, – sa- I wasn't so much a sales manager, but as like a senior salesman, um, people would – respect me when I would pitch them lines a little bit. Mm-hmm. So we had a hell of a time with that because the, the younger people would be like on the phone, they'd be talking to the customer and the guy would be trying to like get out of buying the rent set. And then I'd come up and I'd be like, and they'd have to look at me and I'd be like, you know, okay, say this, you have to say this. And they'd be like, what? I'd be like, Mr. Bradford. And they'd be like, yeah. I even had one customer, and they'd be like, I even had one customer who used to put these wrenches, he used to put these wrenches up his ass. And they'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> 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 it's a crazy time. So, is, so where did you learn? Where is it, was it just on the spot you were learning to paint these pictures and write copy? Or were you – did you have a mentor there that helped? Or what did you do to to get this down where the, all, the whole company is using what you're writing essentially? You know, it, what you would do is you'd go and sit in with the top sales folks mm-hmm. and listen to them pitch and what they would say and the way they would sell things. Mm-hmm. And I didn't – learn so much about actual writing copy from these guys, but more about connection and what they would say to uh, eliminate objections yeah. and also making uh, unbelievable offers or I'm sorry, uh, irresistible offers is the, is the thing, you know, talking about guarantees and uh, the upselling they would do to get these people to, to buy, which is crazy. I mean, like we, uh, one of the things that was one of the, uh, biggest things for the new people to overcome in this, especially myself, was um, you, so when you pitch the guy on this set of wrenches, you know he's a, a one-man shop out there, but you got to, you, they'd want you to be like, okay, Mr. Bramford, I'm going to send you out, uh, so these wrenches, I'm going to send you out a, a, a crate of them, you know, there's just four packs to a crate, and they'd be like, whoa, 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 I don't need four, I'm a one-man shop here, uh, and then you'd be like, Okay, hang on a second. And then you'd like put the phone down if the guy's interested enough. And then the sales manager would come over, or you'd say it yourself, and you'd be like, okay, you know, tell you what, just this once, I got another guy who said he can use two, two sets of these. So that means I can send you the other two and keep you at the same price. But you got to do me a favor. <laughs> you know, it's all, you're all just and asking for something in return. And so you, I also learned by that favor thing, you're always asking that. It's like every call you're asking, you got to do me a favor. You know, you're getting them to commit also. Yeah. And um, we found uh, just taking that back to copywriting, Yeah. we found uh, – uh, This is great, th- Craig. I love this. Go on. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing that we would do is uh, at, we'd, after the uh, uh, video sales presentation, they'd click, uh, you know, next page. And then we'd have them uh, have a, a, a list of things, and it would be like, why do you want this product? So if it was uh, muscle and fitness, it would be like, you know, I'm looking to uh, gain lean mass. Uh, I'm looking to burn fat. I'm looking to get a six-pack. Uh, I'm looking to attract uh, a special woman. Uh, I'm looking to get more respect from men, you know. And we'd have these check boxes that they could check off, and it would be like, click, all, click the ones that indicate the reasons why you want this. Mm-hmm. And then they would click it, and the next page would say, "Congratulations, this will help you." Now here's how to here's you know do you want uh, you know it with this package regular platinum or all that you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's so. How did you overcome people's obje- objections? I could see like they're at the edge of buying. You know, and you probably have to do this. It's I don't know. Would you say it's harder to do it in a um, sales letter form or person to person? What did you do to overcome the objections person to person? And what do you do in some of the, in the sales letters to overcome objections? You know, I would say that the hard thing about person to person is, um, I'm sorry, the easy thing about person to person is they'll tell you the objections. So when you get a new product and you tell it to five people and they're saying, uh, you know, five guys in a row tell you, Oh, that booster pack, I tried one of those and it won't jumpstart my tractor good for a beamer but I only want it for my for my uh, for my tractor 
then you know that that's going to be a common objection, you know, so you throw that into the pitch. Yeah. And with a video sales letter, you never really know. But one thing that we did recently that was really eye-opening is we did a customer survey, and it was all about the video. And we said, you know, what did you like about the video? What didn't you like about the video? What was missing from the video? What um, would you change about it? And we got some really interesting feedback. And some people were like, oh, I really like this story you told of, like, how this problem is created for people. And then... uh, some people would say, I really liked all the credentials of, of the, you know, the person in the video. Um, a lot of people would write, oh, way too long. I got so bored of watching it. You know? But at the same time, this is a customer list, though. You know, so they did actually purchase. You know, right, so right. Not, not think, take those as uh, you know, a grain of salt. We learned a lot of stuff. And um, this was actually, a, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, this was for... Uh, um, uh, one for a product where I wasn't sure if, uh, or I thought the audience was all female. And then I started seeing questions in the video, like, does this work for men? Or in this survey, you know, like, will this work for men? And then I surveyed the customers and it said 10% of them were men. And I was like, whoa, I thought this was a women's product all the way. So went back and changed the, the video by putting things, you know, and because the product has X, Y, and Z, it works especially, uh, you know, it works also for, uh, for men who are trying to use it. Mm-hmm. And I even took out the references to like, you know, if, uh, you know, uh, thousands of women out there are using this solution, I got rid of that. I said thousands of people, you know, mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't checked the, we haven't surveyed again since, but I would imagine that that would have, uh, not, that would have captured more male buyers. Yeah. So, Craig, what was the next big turning point? So, you were working in the tools, telemarketing. What was yeah. next? Um, so, after tools, I went to uh, – I had some other friends that were doing phone sales, uh, selling credit card merchant accounts. And I'd heard you know, they were uh, doing well. So, I was like, hey, can you give me a job there? I'm doing pretty good this this tool stuff. And they're like, oh, no, no, not hiring, whatever. So I went to the competition, and I showed up, put a suit on for this one. And I'm like, hey, I want to work here. You know, I'm, I'm ready to sell. I do this and that. And so they hired me. And um, I wasn't nearly as good at selling credit card merchant accounts as I was at Tools and Supplies. And I think it was because my style was like get someone on the phone, and I would just try to bulldoze them. Because like in the tool thing, you don't. There's no callbacks or anything like that. You don't send info. But with the merchant accounts, it's a bigger decision. They are shopping around, and they. Uh, it's more about building a, a long-term relationship. And then I also just a personality thing with me. I felt bad bugging people after the initial call and like following up with them and calling them. And I think that was my biggest downfall in that. So I was like probably. I mean, I, I kept the job for a while. Uh, I was usually in the middle of the pack um, in, in that uh, occupation with the merchant accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, but in retrospect, now knowing what I know now, I, I you know, could have done a lot better building better relationships, not being afraid to pick up the phone and, and ask for that sale again, and also just by sending them better copy all, as well. So when did you officially get into, you just consider yourself a copywriter? So after that, oh, this is a pretty interesting story, actually, that I've never shared in any All right. before. <laughs> uh, so I was doing that merchant account thing. I was still living in my hometown of Thousand Oaks, which is great if you're a pizza delivery guy. But if you're trying to do anything else, it's like a pretty boring spot. So all my friends who had their shit together had gone off to college, most of them in Santa Barbara, San Diego, or Arizona. That's where people from my uh, California usually go. And San Diego was my first choice. So I decided to move to San Diego. And I told the people I worked with at the merchant account company that I was going to work from home. And I went down there and, you know, I was 22 and I did not have the discipline to work from home. And so that just blew up. And um, from there, I just started bouncing around doing like, uh, I did inbound sales for direct TV call center. And at this job, I, um, I did okay. Like my first month, I made like, uh, I remember it was like 3000 3500 bucks. And it was really long hours, though, and it was really weird hours. It was like um, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m., 
And, you know, when you're 22 years old going out every single night, you know, and sleeping till 10.30 a.m. and then <laughs> going out again to Taco Tuesday at 30 p.m. at night, like your whole day's gone. <laughs> so uh, I quit that after a month um, because I was like, oh, I was doing this merchant, merchant account thing. I was making a little bit more money doing the merchant accounts, you know, and I don't want to work these long hours. I'll just get some other kind of sales job somewhere. And there was nothing. I couldn't find shit. I was bouncing around from job to job. Um I, I tried do, uh, doing mortgages. Uh, I sucked at that also because that was the same type of thing as the credit card merchant accounts, building relationships. Longer term. Yeah. yeah. Math and explaining that stuff. I'm terrible at like, explaining math to people or, and not very good at doing it myself. Um, so then I got this job working at this automotive marketing company. And what this company did was they would put on sales for uh, car dealerships. So they would go and like they do like a, a, a you know key insert where they drop fifty thousand keys in newspapers in a city, and one of them would win the car. Oh yeah, bring in like you know ideally you get like a thousand people to come in and try their key, and then uh, while they're on the lot, you know the uh, salesman would try to uh, interest them in a car. Yeah. And I, the funny thing about those things that I, I didn't know until I did it. Is when they do that, one of the keys that goes out has to open the car. Right. And uh, every once in a while, someone does win the car. And that's actually great when it happens for the dealership because then they can run it in all their ads. Like, hey, we gave away this car. You know, it's an awesome promotion. Um, and there's, uh, they use an insurance company that has to pay that if, if someone actually wins. So interesting side note, I thought. Yeah. Uh, we'd also do things like that too where it's like you know come down to the dealership and like hit a golf ball to hit this amazing putt you know to win uh ten thousand dollars off the price of a car and things like that you know they can i uh, like the key thing yeah yeah it's pretty interesting and the cool thing about the key from an advertising standpoint is the key weighs a little uh weighs a bit so if you send a key through the mail someone's going through the mail the key falls out with the ad on uh. the out of the mail so gary halbert would have would loved that one same with the newspaper, not quite as prominent, but you know, it's still you feel something in there, and like sometimes it'll fall off the floor. That's what you want because then it gets your attention. Mm -hmm. So I was doing this, and um, this is when I got I was uh, really low on cash. This is when I was like uh, going to McDonald's with coupons, you know, and like getting real happy when the boss would buy us lunch. Um, I had to sell my TV to pay rent. Um, and I remember I had all these cavities and stuff too, and like uh, I couldn't afford to go to the dentist and shit. Like it was. So you're, uh, were you in pain? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was popping Advil and stuff, and then finally my mom came and took care of my dentist when she f realized what was going on. You know, she's like, "Okay, you know, I'm gonna I'll pay for your dentist thing," and she found me a dentist and got it set up. So love you, mom. Thanks. Uh, but, I'll send uh, this to her. Yeah, I was I was broke as a joke, um, but you know, San Diego's got two dollar drink nights, so. So what got you out of that? So um, I, through friends I had met, Evan Pagan, and he had recently started his Double Your Dating company. And he showed me this, this sales letter and how he was selling this ebook online. And I'd never heard of an ebook, and And, you know, I couldn't believe that he was actually making money selling this downloadable file. And I took his original Double Your Dating letter one day, and I was like, I wonder if this could be used, this style of, because I just, I, it was so captivating to me. I was like, I wonder if this could be used for uh, um, to let a car dealership know what we do. And I took it and I changed it all to, you know, um, I think the headline was, uh, uh, here's how to attract any woman you want or something like that. And I changed the headline to, you know, here's how to sell uh, 40 or 50 cars in one weekend, guaranteed. And then I uh, talked about us in the letter and I just basically like switched his proof elements with what his story to like our story as a marketing company and this is funny because uh, to me still to this day because I, I did have one guy on the inside who was a sales manager at a car dealership and I sent this to him and I was like hey man what do you think of this uh, it's it's not what we usually send out what, that, what we would do in that business is we'd call up the dealer and try to sell them over the phone then we'd send them information which was like Basically, like a flyer. It wasn't very good copy at all. And then we just kept try to keep like convincing them. You'd be like, "Hey, man, we sold thirty cars down in Arizona last week. You know, you wanted to give us a shot yet? Hey, we just, you know, how far are you from Palmdale? We just sold fifty cars down there. You know, what? When are we? You know, let us come down there. And it was just like an endless grind until one would fall. And it was so rare. I mean, I probably did like three deals in the year I worked there. No, I was making like 
two or three thousand a deal. I mean, it was it was not easy uh, pickings in that business. Um, and I, I remember I sent that thing to my buddy, and it was like you know seven or eight pages long or something like that. It was way bigger than the usual packet. And I'm like, what do you think about this? And he's like, I think that's really good. I think you should send it to the other dealerships instead of this usual crap you're sending because this usual thing is, is what everyone gets. And I'm like, ah, interesting. But you know what? I didn't do it. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I just, I, I just like, you know, I think I was just afraid to try something different. And it, uh, actually now it makes me think of when I you know will give someone some copy advice or whatever and they're like oh yeah yeah that's great advice and then like I'll talk to them six months later hey did you try that thing I didn't know oh no we're busy testing other things and all that you know like, so uh, I, I guess I can relate um, but anyway I found out Eb, uh, what Evan was up to and selling this ebook and I started studying his newsletters and things like that and I remember um, he used to send out a newsletter three times a week and it was like a dating tip newsletter and he had this cool format where one uh, I, one day, the first day, he'd just send out like a, a tip or strategy. Um, and then like two days later, he'd send out a Q&A, which would take one question from a reader and answer it. Um, like, you know, hey, hey uh, you know, how do I get my ex-girlfriend back? And then he'd like answer it long. And then the third email of the week was called a mailbag where he'd take like all types of questions and answer them in this really funny manner. And it'd be like, uh, you know, just kind of like a Dear Abby type of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he told me that... Uh, he was making, on average, every time he'd send one out, he was making $4,000 in sales. And the thing that was interesting to, to, um, to even Evan himself was he thought the ones where it was like a dating tip where it would be all his own stuff would convert the best, but it was the opposite of the Dear Abby mailbag style mm. thing that would get the most sales. And it's because, you know, it's, it's almost like built-in testimonials in there. Yeah, yeah. Answering different questions and objections. And... It uh, uh, gives you a uh, way to see like different, um, I don't know, it's, uh, sorry, I just ADD'd like out. Different like types of people and what they're struggling with maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also show off by giving like, you know, three techniques or strategies instead of just like one, you know, so... Those things did very well. So I remember reading these things, and I was like, you know, I could maybe write these things. And, you know, I'm, I'm one day sitting home, and it's a, I remember it was a Friday night, and for some reason I didn't go out, which is very rare for me at 22. And I was like, I'm going to write one of these. So I, I wrote one of these dating tips, and I called it uh, Two Ways to Kiss a Girl or something like that. And it was like, you know, offer to share your chapstick with her, or like, you know, something like, <laughs> like, like really cheesy stuff. But I thought they were funny at the time. And I tried to write it in um, the exact style of David D'Angelo, which was the character Evan created. Right. So I did that, and then I wrote a headline the exact same way, and I was like, okay, I see how he capitalizes the first letter of each word. I'm going to do that. And I see how he signs it, your friend David D. So at the end, I wrote, your friend, Craig C. And he always had a P.S. at the end of each one. I, was, I didn't know why he did that, but I was like, you know, P.S., if you enjoy these tips, make sure you stay tuned because the ones next week are going to be awesome. So I sent that to his email box and I wanted it to look like one of his own emails. And I wanted it, my goal was for him to open it up and start reading it and like not recognize that it wasn't something he wrote himself. I wanted him to think he actually wrote it and forgot about it or something like that, you know? So I sent that. I didn't hear from him a couple of days. And then like uh, I remember, you know, sometime in the next week I got an email from him. He's like, okay, now we can talk. Because I've been bugging him for a job. I was like, dude, I'll come to, like make your coffee and shit. I just want to learn like how you're making this money because you know I'm in debt right now. So uh, yeah, I started off working for him. Um, doing, I did all types of random stuff with the company, everything from buying uh, banner traffic to managing the affiliate program to like customer service type stuff, like answering questions. Guys would write in, hey, will this help me get my ex back? And I'd be like, you know, uh, maybe, but. Even if you don't, you know, you should try this technique on page six that will help you, you know, meet these girls and all that. I tell you what, buy it. And if you're not interested, I'll personally make sure you get your refund. You know, I was like, like using some of those tool uh, uh, bonding Guaranteed, things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I started working with him. And then, like, I actually worked for Evan probably two years before I started writing copy. Just doing, um, you know, whatever needed to be done. It was a really exciting time because we started off, I was the ninth employee. Um, you know, it was up around 80 or so wow. uh, by the time we parted ways. It was really exciting because it was like 
that was actually my first real foray into the business world, working around successful business folks, and it also got me um, to grow up, so to speak. And actually, there was a time when I was I was 25, and we had all we all worked virtually. And Elbing calls me up, and he's like, "Hey, I've decided we're going to get a real office." And I'm, I'm starting, it's going to be called the R&D team. We're going to be doing all kinds of cool stuff there. And the office is going to be in L.A. And, you know, I was still living in San Diego. And I had moved down there to get away from L.A. And on the side, I was also working uh, as an MC at this bar on Saturday mm. nights called the Typhoon Saloon. And this place was like, uh, kind of like the uh, wild, like, you know, uh, didn't have a mechanical bull, but uh, it should have, like one of those places. Yeah. like. You know, they'd like to have me dress up as Elvis and go on the bar and like, you know, pour shots with people. <laughs> and it was just like a really fun Saturday night gig. So I knew everyone in the town and, you know, um, and I was a pretty uh, awkward youth. You know, I was really shy in high school. Really? Well, very. I won most bashful in eighth grade. That, that's a, that Are was you fun. serious? Yeah, I was in the Hall of Fame. Like, because <laughs> the highest guy in the whole freaking school. Um, actually, Real shyest guy in the whole freaking school. No one probably knew who he was enough to like, you know. <laughs> I, was, I was the guy that hung around like the cool guys, you know, just like, you know, looking up to them and all that, but uh, uh, kind of the, the butt of the jokes and, and things like that. So San Diego was really where I came into my own, you know, after high school and I had a great group of friends and I was meeting girls for pretty much the first time. I did not want to leave that place, but Eben's like, so... You know, you can, uh, if you want to move up to LA, I'd love to have you on this R&D team I'm starting. Um, if you want to stay down there, you're going to be working for someone on the R&D team. I was like, shit, you know, what am I going to do? And I was like, well, I'm 25. I guess it's time to grow up. And so I packed up my shit and moved up to LA, started in Venice, and I hated it up there. But it was awesome. I was living, uh, you know, real close to Eben. Um, and another guy named Matthew Monahan, who was, uh, became my best friend. And even though he was younger than me, this guy is brilliant. And he became a mentor to me as well. And was he the guy who founded inflection or, uh, yeah, I've talked to Matt before. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great, really dude. smart guy. Yeah. So this is back when he was, uh, uh, so I remember we celebrated his 21st birthday and he didn't drink cause he had to get up the next day and write a newsletter. And that's how dedicated this guy was. So I just worked a lot and I was bored because I didn't have a big circle of friends up there, you know, because like uh, Thousand Oaks is far removed from L.A. Uh, and all that. Um, and I had a lot of free time in my hands. And, and during that, I also started doing affiliate marketing on the side. And that uh, and I got my brothers into it. And that was actually formed the early part of the company that we have now. We were just doing lead gen um, in different markets as affiliates. And learning uh, all the back-end internet stuff and you know I was still writing copy for Eben I worked for him almost five years and you know he was an amazing mentor and teacher It was so awesome being able to write stuff and send it to Eben and he'd be like okay you know this sucks <laughs> I'll be like this is good we're mailing it to our email list of a million people so the first thing I actually wrote the first piece of copy got emailed to a million people Wow. So exciting. The, oh, I should say the first usable piece of copy. I wrote a lot of crap copy that never saw the light of day, but then I finally wrote something like I was up to his par. He's like, okay, we're going to send it out. And I was like, just, I remember that day just refreshing the cart and watching the sales come in and all that. I was like, oh, wow, this is like my debut as a copywriter. You know? So that was cool. Uh, great experience. So, um, Craig, tell me, um, what are some of the most successful campaigns? Because I know I mentioned the top of the interview, you have three new businesses that are eight-figure businesses. What are some of the successful campaigns you can talk about and what, like break it down, what, what worked with them? Um, you know, I'll, tell, I'll talk about uh, one interesting one that wasn't a video that I created, but did um, pretty well. Uh, and it was a company that we really got into by accident. And that is uh, City Cosmetics. So we had been doing um, uh, different uh, dating advice and, and supplements and, and uh, things like that. And actually, we still do some affiliate marketing as well. Um, 
And uh, someone came to my business partner. He's like, hey, we have this cosmetics company. And these guys are looking for an investor who can expand their presence online. They used to be in retail. They used to be in Sephora in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, and their lip plumper called City Lips was the number two seller in all Sephora. But the, the owner, uh, you know, didn't, uh, I don't know the exact story, actually, because this is a couple owners removed from when we, we ended up moving forward on it. Um, some of them that didn't pay the taxes right or whatever. Um, long story short, we looked up into this company and people love the products. In the forums, it would be like, oh, City Lips is the best. And, you know, I love their uh, uh skin creams and all this stuff, you know, like it had old, like, you know, Amazon does the ratings. It was like, all their stuff was like four stars, four and a half. Yeah. Like these are, these are really good products. And they were not doing that well on internet sales. They were doing like 20 grand a month at a loss. And they wow. had been doing 20 grand a month at a loss for like, you know, three or four years. Jeez. No longer in retail. Cause that like those contracts uh, went down with the, when the first owner got rid of the business or whatever. And you know, we, we made some, some uh, interesting deal with them where we were going to expand their presence online and um, we, uh, we noticed that they weren't using any of the traditional marketing techniques and then there was also this video um, on YouTube that we found and it was uh, ABC News um, back in 2008 when lip plumpers were really hot. ABC News had an in-house doctor named Dr. Dina Dell who would do like, you know, regular, like once a night he'd do like Dr. Dina Dell special. And one night he does lip plumpers. You know, what's the phase? Like, can you really plump your lips? And he puts all these lip plumpers to the test in their labs and they find that City Lips is the best lip plumper. Wow. Like, his team of chemists found that it increased lip plumpers by three millimeters over 30 days. I mean, this is like ABC That's News. huge. And they had, this is a minute and a half video clip. And... They weren't even using this. So we made the investment. We put that video clip on the front page of the site. We started running traffic with that, and they went crazy. Because, I mean, that's video. Like, how can you get a better proof element from ABC News, their own in-house doctor? Third-party chemist, yeah. And there was, like, a dentist in the video talking about how it was safe and fine to use on the lips and all that, and real women who love the stuff. And we put that up, and um, it did, did uh, really well uh, for, for a long time. And that's how we got into the, the cosmetics business was – through that, you know, um, and oh, funny, interesting story. We so the internet has changed a lot since we started uh, marketing, and you know, since I started working for Evan, it used to be if you can grab someone's attention with a, a long form sales letter or a video, and you know, make your case that they would give your product and service a try. These days, the consumer is much smarter. I mean, you know, for for example, I mean, if not it wasn't too long ago when browsers didn't tab browsing didn't even exist. We couldn't even open tabs. But now the average person knows how to open tabs. They probably have ten open on their browser at all times. They know how to look up reviews and shop and compare and all this stuff. You know, so when we started doing the city cosmetics, um, we after we made the investment, we realized the people that we uh, made the investment with that we didn't get along. We weren't good uh, a good fit. So we were trying to figure out if we could uh, buy the rest of the company if they wanted to buy us out or whatever. But we're like, okay, we know the cosmetics business now. This is good. So we're going to start our own cosmetics line. So we went and started our own cosmetics line in the meantime, just in case the city cosmetics thing didn't work out. Um, we really wanted city cosmetics because of that long history and, and that video. You know, the video was so powerful. That's key, yeah. We're like, oh, just in case, you know, we can make our own video or something like that, you know. So we started another, another cosmetics company. We put it up. We did the same strategy and all that, and it didn't convert. It did not convert worth a shit. Wow. And I think it was because when you popped up this new company's name, there was nothing there. Whereas if you pop up City Cosmetics, I you see. got views on Amazon from years old. And if they look deeper, they can find posts in like forums, you know, made in like 2006 where women are like City lips, lip, lip plumpers, the only thing that doesn't irritate my lips and things like that, you know. So that made us think like, okay, we really need City Cosmetics. We really need this. And then uh, finally, you know, a year later, we were able to come to terms and uh, acquire the company, and uh, you know, it's going well. So. Nice, I love that. So, yeah, because when I talked to your brother at the uh, Titans, he told me a little bit of that story. Um, okay. Yes, um, it's not a crazy story. <laughs> What's the, that? It's it's a longer story than that, but uh, yes. um, but the interesting learning. So, what else um, from your history? would be good for people to learn from as far as successful campaigns and why they were effective? Uh, let's see. 
you have a good you do a good job and i was watching a video this week of you of really getting deep with headlines and going beyond the initial phase kind of going beyond the internal mind of what people are thinking with headlines can you talk about some of your process when you're working and developing a headline for some of your campaigns yeah so nowadays the game has just changed a little bit in the uh headline space because uh we're doing a lot more video so it's more about the first you know couple of minutes mm -hmm. that's what you need to think about yeah and that first couple of minutes i think um i think is as hard as headlines used to be to write a good one I think now it's even harder to write a compelling thing because you've got to actually hook them with this video thing, you know? Um, it's got to be something that, like, rattles them. Um, I saw one recently. I was just, like, looking at the top ClickBank products, you know, for research, which is always a great way to do research and pop up the uh, uh, top things in whatever market you like. Mm -hmm. and one of the videos started out um, with some, it was something crazy, like, you know, I was nine years old and my father was holding a gun to my head. <laughs> like, how can you not want to hear the rest of that? Right, story? you have to listen. No matter what it's about. And it was something like about weight loss or something like that. You know, it was like something crazy. So, if you, you, you know, think of stuff that's like really freaking interesting. Um, and Eben used to like get really geeky into like what is interesting to the human mind. So um, an example that he made that's like subtle that people don't really uh, think about but really stands out is it's like um, if you picture an ice cream sundae, you got the, the ice cream and chocolate syrup and, and, and nuts on it. And that, those are all kind of like the same uh, context and all that, you know. But then on top is a glistening red cherry that just – if you think about it, I mean, that looks is a really sharp contrast, you know, that that pop of red. And, um, you know, actually, it's funny because uh, I took a picture when I was walking home from the gym right before this interview. And it's a it's a woman crossing the street. It's all rainy in New York today. And she's holding an umbrella and she's got a red bag. And I was like, Psh! I was like, that looks like stood out, you know. Um, but if you so when you're making headlines or any type of intro, you want to grab someone's attention. You got to think, what can you enter into the mix that isn't always there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, I, I don't even remember if I had the exact wording of that ClickBank thing, right? But just to use that as an example, it's like, you know, if you start off a story, you know, like, I was nine years old, my father turned to me and said, you know, I mean, that's semi-interesting. You know, you might want to hear what the dad said, but like, it's like, I was nine years old, my father had a gun to my head. It's like, that's just like twisted. Adds that crazy element, you know? So what else do you do for research? Because that's a really, that's a valuable tip. Someone can go to ClickBank and see kind of what some of the top, you know it's performing, it's one of the top products. What else do you do to research something? Um, New York Times. New York Times is amazing. The thing I love about the New York Times is it's, it's all solid shit that's like verified and real. So... Anytime I'm, I'm doing something on anything, I'll just type in NYT and see what type of articles pop up. No matter how old they are, they usually have like something to say about anything that's popular. Mm -hmm. And it's also a good place to find trends, too. You know, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm on the New York Times um, app right now on my phone. And it's like, you know, one thing I've learned uh, that we touched on a little bit at the beginning of this is that the, uh, the home runs are in the cold banner traffic. You know, the, or the cold direct mail pieces or newspapers or, or things like that. You know, it's, it's, uh, you can get a little bit of action from Google paid pay per click, you know, bidding on terms that people type in or, uh, you know, getting real targeted niche like, you know, how to raise guinea pigs and all that and do really well. But like, if you want a big winner, you got to convert to someone who's just browsing around. So I like to uh, read the New York Times and see what is on people's minds, you know, and that'll give me hooks and ideas for a story. Mm -hmm. So um, tr I'm trying to think if there's uh oh, okay. So just a, uh, yesterday, this is pretty interesting. Um, 
I don't know if it actually aired yesterday, but uh, sometime in the last week, Barbara Streisand, Streisand went on Dr. Oz to speak out about the number one killer of women, hmm. which is uh, heart health. That got picked up in USA Today. I mean, so that's big right now. Hmm. People are talking about heart health and specifically women's heart health. And that's a big market, you know? So if you wanted to uh, create something around that, you know, like it was an uh, info product and, uh, you know, ways that you could, uh, you know, I have better heart health teaming up with a, a doctor and maybe attach a celebrity on there too. I mean, imagine that, Jeremy, if it was like a, you know, uh, if, if you're, you had uh, someone in, in your life that you cared about that was an older woman and it was like, you know, a reputable doctor and celebrity that had put this thing together with like, you know, strategies and tips to have a healthy heart. I mean, mm. that'd be something that. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, right. I love that. Yeah. ClickBank, New York Times. What about, Craig, what's something, um, we talked about some successful campaigns what about one that didn't work that you thought was just gonna blow through the roof and do amazing and why yeah um you know i mean i have one but i can't i've never figured out why well, <laughs> Go ahead. because you never know so my business partner is a former gym owner and a pers former personal trainer and is in amazing shape and has this very unique workout system and I wrote a sales letter to sell it, and I thought the sales letter was awesome. I did so much research that it like changed my own workout habits and stuff, you know, because I learned about like human development and all this. And I even like was teaching myself new copywriting concepts because I was like, when I would explain a concept in the letter, I would prove that the concept worked. And then I was like proofing my proof, and I was like, whoa, this is the next level. Get what Gary Benson, Benson Venga talks about about like proof. It's like I'm proving my proof is real. This is so good. Like I'm, this is gonna change the world. I'm gonna talk about this letter in presentations because of all this stuff, you know, and um, totally bombed. So you don't know why? Well, actually, okay, I. I think I have an idea. Um, while the letter was about muscle building, I made the intro about weight loss. And I think if I re went back and read it today, I haven't even looked at this thing in years. I should take it out because this thing probably just needs a few tweaks to start working. Like one tweak, yeah. But um, that, uh, yeah, I made the letter start off in the. I, ha uh, I have a friend who lost like 50 pounds doing a. a, a workout that was like similar enough um to my business partners that he looked at it and he's like yeah you know this is like good to go all that so um he we were gonna make uh he was gonna down to be the rep to represent the product so it was about how he lost 50 pounds and it was like you know this started off this thing started off with a uh, doctor talking it's like you know when mike visited me he needed a miracle he was like you know x pounds overweight and all that you know i put him on this routine working out just you know four times a week, blah, blah, and here he is now. And, you know, it was all, like, true stuff and all that, but it was, I, I think that if I had just targeted it actually to guys wanting to get in shape, because it was actually, it was for really hard workouts. Mm -hmm. uh, the workouts are, um, like, CrossFit style, um, but it was like, uh, I forget the thing. Um, I don't know, it doesn't matter what the workouts were, but they're really fucking hard. So I think, like, a weight loss person would read that and they'd be like, ah, oh, you know, someone like that overweight that might not uh, want to jump right into an mm -hmm. insanity type workout. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You'll have to dust it off today. Yeah, I do need to dust it off. Yes. That's one day. You can so, see that. Craig, since it's Inspired Insider, I ask, um, what's been, you know, obviously you've had tons of success. What's been a low moment? And then what you thought about to kind of push through those tough times? Um, business, personal, both. What? Uh, yeah, whatever comes to mind is a, is a low moment. Um, let me business see. Business and or personal. Maybe I can give you one of each. Yeah, go ahead. Um. Oh well, the recession was an interesting time. So, um, the recession uh, hit. W dating while I was working there, and by this time it was W dating. We had catch and keep him for women. We had the Altitude brand. And uh, a lot of layoffs were made, myself included. And I was like, oh, that's fine because my affiliate marketing business was cranking at the time. You know, I was making way more money doing the affiliate marketing than I, I was getting uh, salary with Eben. So I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, and I had this business going with my, my two brothers. 
um, and this is like 2008, and then uh, slowly as the economy started showing up, people stopped. Even though we weren't selling the products, they weren't buying on off our affiliate links. You know, the people just started tightening up their wallets, and the money just stopped coming in. And I had to move out of my mansion in the hills and like sell my Porsche and shit like that and move into an apartment with my brother. And I was like, fuck, that was it. It's over. <laughs> you know, like, it's tough. Those are some good times, but who knows what's going to happen next. And this is when like things were getting really scary. And, you know, my brother's a former Marine and all that. And I'm like, okay, dude, um, I want you to teach me how to use a gun. <laughs> you know, it's like survival type yeah, of thing. Yeah, like this could get crazy. That was when Neil Strauss's book came out that was uh, called, like, you know, uh, what was it? rescue 911 or some shit like that i don't know it was a crazy time and um we that was when we met our other business partner josh and josh uh had seen me uh, speak at uh one of eben's uh, altitude programs and he just found me for consulting and he had this idea for a new product and he came out to la and this he was super driven um He'd had the same thing happen to him. Um, he had made a lot of money in commercial real estate, and then he had his gym going and all that, and then like uh, you know did a few uh, bad um, internet deals trying to launch a book, uh, like kind of like a Tony Robbins type of thing. Because Josh is an amazing story that hopefully we'll get to tell one day about how he uh, beat Crohn's disease and is just really doing fantastic. Um, but this guy was just so fired up and gun ho. He's like, okay, I want to do this. You know, let's let's make this new thing and all this. And he had all this energy and excitement. And we're just like, fuck it, we, you know, might as well. And like during the time I was trying to take on, I was taking on copy uh, side clients just to like pay, keep the lights on, you know, like just while we were like cranking up this new uh, uh, company. Um, but his energy got us through that, you know, and it just uh, was a good lesson for me showing that like, you know, just because like times are down, it could be an opportunity for success if you look at it in the right way, you know, because you can build something and get it going. So that's a business one. Yeah, I, I remember reading your post like when I was researching this, and um, you have this great video of a song being played that really means a lot to you, and um, it starts off, I've had a crazy effing year, some of the highest highs of my life and some of the pretty low lows of my life. You know what I'm talking about? That was the got dumped year. Was it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the way that started off... Um, just a sec. I see the uh, little battery. It's uh, how to save a perfect moment was right. the uh, was the post. Um. So. Uh, okay, my I'm I'm making the battery on my computer is giving is giving me that like beep, 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 but okay. Well, we no, have. I know you have another appointment in a few minutes anyway. So. Um, good closer though. It was a pretty shitty time. <laughs> um. So. I was... Because you're pretty open. You know, like, no, most people, like, if you read that post, most people would not share any of that with someone close to them, let alone put it in a blog post. Like, you talked about some pretty personal stuff, um, like, from relationships to parents to whatever in that post. Yeah, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, and I'll give you specifics. I don't, I don't care. Um, you know, it's probably good to, now. <laughs> I didn't want to share those at the time, but... Um, so yeah, I, I um, had met this girl. I was totally in love. I thought I was going to marry this girl, and um, you know, s silly me uh, thinking as a man, I was like, "Well, I'm going to marry this girl, so I'm probably not going to be hooking up with any other girls ever again." And this, this logic is so, just sounds so crazy to me. Even like saying it, like, how was I ever thinking this logic, right? But, but you know, I was. Uh, and I was thinking, well, before I make it official with her, I need to, like, you know, go on a boy's trip and, like, you know, have my last summer of, like, partying and meeting other girls because I'm going to marry this girl and then that's going to be it, you know? So um, I never actually, like, made the move to become exclusive with her. And... You know, I'm kind of like waiting until summer's over, you know, because I, uh, a year before I had been in the Ukraine partying with a, a friend and we had decided that we were going to go back and like do it again the next summer. And we had planned this out and he had gotten a house there in Odessa, Ukraine. And so I'm like, okay, this is going to be like my, my last hurrah summer, you know, so I'm going to do this up Odessa. So I go and um, I'm dating this girl and I'm like, you know, 
hey, uh, you know, I'm just going. Uh, we were in Europe together, and then she went home, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go visit, visit have my uh, boys trip now, and then I'll come back, and everything will be fine. So, go on the boys trip. Um, everything's going well. There's this club there called Club Ibiza. It's this crazy club there. And, uh, you know, like dancing performers, like a thousand people inside. And we went there like two or three nights in a row. Um, everything was fun and good. Um, but then uh, the last night was a Saturday night. And my friend had been out there for a month, my uh, friend Richard. And he didn't want to go out. And I'm like, dude, it's my last night in Europe. I got to go out. You know, I'm not going to stay home. And he's like, well, maybe Alex will want to go out. So Alex was his best friend. And Alex was like, yeah, I'll go out. But Alex was had a, a girl he'd been seeing. So it was... So we went out, the three of us, and like at midnight, Alex is like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm bored, Craig, we're just going to go home, you know, and I'm like, man, really, it's midnight, and he's like, yeah, you know, uh, we're over it, and I met a, made a few other friends in the city, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to hang out, so they left, so uh, I'm hanging, um, keep on drinking, pretty soon it's like 4 or 5 a.m., you know, I, I was hanging around with a couple guys that I knew from previous summers or whatever, but like, then I, I got lost, and, and uh, I'm pretty hammered at this point. And this dude comes up to me. This like seemed like he was like 19, 20 years old, and he's like, "Man, you're a legend, man! I seen you, you know, talking to these girls. Like, let's hang out." I'm like, "Okay." So he and I start doing shots and shit. You know, we're having a great time. Pretty soon, like 6 a.m. rolls around. He's like, "Oh, I'm gonna take you to a party with the locals. You know, let's let's go after party." I'm like, "Okay, cool." So we start walking, and there's this like main drag at the end of it, this parking lot. We come out to the parking lot. And there's uh, four four of his buddies there. He's like, "Hey, Craig, you know these are my friends." I'm like, "What's up, guys?" And the guys grab me. And I'm like, you know, I try to try to escape, and I and like these guys are like fucking pulling me, and I go to run, and they like jump on me and start fucking pounding me and stuff. And I'm like, "Holy shit!" And the guy just like the original dude just like walks away laughing. And I'm like, "What the fuck, bro? You know how could you do this?" And the guys pick me up, and I'm like. These dudes are, are pretty good sized, and I'm a pretty good sized dude myself, but like there was no movement. They throw me in the back of this car, and we start driving, and I'm like, oh, fuck. Oh, my God. I'm here. So, um, and this is like the one point in my life where I was just sitting in the back seat. I got a guy on each side of me. I got two guys in the front. I'm sitting there. I'm just thinking to myself, I'm completely fucked. And so... You know, I was I was so drunk, it's embarrassing that I don't even remember the exact details of the story. What I think happened is I think I got my phone, and I knew this guy, Eugene, who had found our house there, and he was from Odessa, and I was like, hey, guys, I'm not just some asshole tourist. Like, I'm here with local friends. We can call my friends, and you can talk to them. It's okay. So I called up my friend Eugene, and I was like, here, call, talk to Eugene. And I gave it to the guy in shotgun. It was the only guy that spoke a little bit of English, and he talks to Eugene in Russian. I don't know what he's saying or anything, and then, like, I opened up my wallet and I had like 400 euros in there. I'm like, hey man, just you know, take the keep the phone and just take my 400 euros. Just just let me go. And they just like pulled over side and just threw me out of the car. Um, and I had to find my way home. But like, oh my time god, the sun's coming out. I had to like you know go down to the main strip. I'm like asking Did anyone speak English. Can someone walk me home? And I found finally found some guy to walk me home. It took us an hour and a half to get to the house. And I gave him like my I woke up my roommate, gave him like 800 dollars Ukraine. It was like 80 bucks for walking me home. Um, and then. Uh, like then I like my my uh, girl at the time, um, you know when she hears about that going down, it was just like eye opening to her. Like you know what the fuck am I doing? Like dating this dude that's like going doing this crazy stuff, hasn't even talked about making a commitment to me. We've been dating like four or five months, you know. Like this is stupid. I'm out. And I was oh. like, oh no, wait, I'm in love with you. I'm thought we're getting married and stuff. And you know, and she's like too little too late and like you know and i was like she's right <laughs> like this is dumb uh i was just making all the wrong moves and i definitely had that coming um and it was it was a big bummer but on the upside it some i guess sometimes it takes something like that to realize that one i had a like crazy binge drinking problem i quit drinking hard alcohol since then now i only drink beer and wine it's been a lot better for me um two i just had all kinds of like confused logic about uh you know dating and relationships so that like got me to like wake the fuck up there and realize that you know you gotta uh man up if you want to make something work and like you know you can't try to like still be a fucking mm. uh same old pizza delivery guy running around you know yeah um and um yeah you know i mm. 
just got me on, on track. That's crazy, Craig. That's crazy. This yeah. needs to be an email sequence, like, <laughs> or something. Because <laughs> I would have just been, you know, because it's like a perfect copy. You go away from the girl and you go into this whole story on the Ukraine. Um, last question. I know you have to go to your appointment. Is what about, I know we talked about the low point. What has been the proudest moment for you? Um. You know, I feel pretty proud sitting here telling that story, knowing I'm not that same guy anymore that uh, was doing that dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> it really is, yeah. I have to say, I've come a lot, uh, a long way in those past few years, and I, I learned the lessons, and you know, I, I feel like a different person now, and that feels good. Um, Business wise, you know, it's always nice to write a great promotion, but I think more so, like my brothers and my business partner Josh and I have, mm. have built this team, and it makes me really happy when I get a letter from one of our staff saying, "Hey, Craig, I just want you to know I'm really thankful for the opportunity to work here and learning so much and excited about business because that's how I felt when I was working with Eben. So when mm. I get those letters like that from people on our team, yeah. that is uh, it's such a great feeling for me. Yeah. Craig, where should people? Thank you so much. It's been hugely valuable. Where should people reach out to you to say thank you or check out whatever you're doing? Uh, I. Um, been talking about doing a personal blog forever. Someday it'll start. I got a few things up at CraigClemens.com. Um, you know, if you if you want me to write some more, please by all means tell me to get off my lazy ass and do it. <laughs> I would like to self motivate there. Uh, Instagram Craig R Clemens, um, and yeah, I guess that's it. Awesome, Craig. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Take care, Jerry. Bye-bye.